Welcome to the Rebecca Panapinto Project. I'm so excited to release this episode today as I had an opportunity to sit down with a friend named Rich Redman and talk all about his adventures. So Rich is an award-winning recording and touring drummer that's based in Nashville and Los Angeles. And he's been with Jason Aldean for over 20 years now. But not only has he played with Jason, Rich has also recorded, toured, and performed with Carrie Underwood, Ludacris, Kelly Clarkson, Brian Adams, Bob Seger, Joe Perry, Garth Brooks, Chris Stapleton, Jewel, Miranda Lambert, Luke Bryan, Thompson Square, Keith Urban, and Kelsey Ballerini. So pretty much all of my favorite country acts in Nashville, Rich has had the opportunity to play some music with. He's an incredible guy, has amazing energy, and you're going to really love hearing all about Rich's story and an incredible book he released called Crash Course for Success. Rich Redman, how are you? How are you? It's great. Happy New Year. I'm, I'm awesome. Same here. Yeah, I'm so stoked to have this conversation. I've just been a fan of yours for as long as I've known who you were. And I think of all of the drummers in Nashville, you give back more than anybody. And I just have always thought highly of you because of that. So thanks for being on the show today. Oh, well, thank you. Thanks so much. I appreciate it. So let's talk about who Rich Redmond was to become who Rich Redmond is. You had a very <laughs> interesting journey. Um, as much as like studying music, which is something I never even did to start my career. But that first moment you ever were introduced to drums, take us to that moment. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, I think this you hear this so much in interviews where it's like the drums chose me. You know, um, you know, there's a lot of stories where it's like, oh, my brother had a set of drums in the attic or my went to my uncle's house and he had a set of drums and I just sat down and I just knew how to play good do good do scuzz good do because it just I knew how to do it instinctually I don't even really know if that was me I just like I had energy you know and I was drawn to it and also I think what really helped was my dad loves drums I mean he loves Gene Krupa you know, doom, doom, he just always loved the big band uh era early rock and roll I think he was friends with the first drummer from Bill Haley in the comments you know rock rock around the clock, early rock and roll. And my grandparents used to go, you know, into New York City and dance at the Savoy Ballroom to like Chick Webb and all those, all the big bands. So I think it's in my blood. I'm, I'm a black sheep in my family since I'm, I'm really the only person that plays music. I mean, my brother is a outdoorsman. My, my other brother is kind of, kind of in the entertainment industry and everybody's in the medical field, but then I'm a drummer. So I was just called to it. You know, I got a blue sparkle snare drum, started getting some lessons in, uh, Geez, I was six or seven years old. Great teacher showed me how to hold the sticks. Got some Joel Rothman books, you know, the Encyclopedia of Rock and Roll Drumming. And I learned how to do those military marches. And it was just great. I was ahead of the curve. Then I moved to El Paso, Texas, joined the high, the school band in the fifth grade. And that's always great because it gives you uh, confidence and you go like, wow, I'm really good at this. And oh, the girls are noticing me. And, and then it's cool because then you learn how to play the crash cymbals and the timpani and the bass drum and the triangles and develop your musicianship. And it just never stops. So six or seven years old, blue sparkle snare drum, fell in love with it. And then the tipping point for me was um, Stuart Copeland, um, synchronicity. You know, I had it on cassette yes. tape. That was mm -hmm. back. I'm showing my age, but we would all belong to the Columbia record and tape club. And we, for a penny, we would get all these records and they would come to your house and you're like, all right, man, it work. Van Halen, Charlie Daniels band, the soundtrack to, to uh, staying alive, but really um, synchronicity. That was the one that was like, this is what I'm going to do with my life. Thank you for Stuart Copeland. I hope I get to uh, meet him at some point. You know? Very cool. Oh, that's awesome. I'm surprised you haven't met him. No. Yeah. I mean, he's, you know, he, uh, I kind of know the area where he lives, but you know, I don't want to be, um, you know, locked up in the, the Beverly Hills police station for lurking outside of, of his bedroom window, you know? Oh, I love it. If you haven't watched count me in, you would love Good it. Good one. Good one. Uh, I, I have a student, Marissa Testa, mm -hmm. who I taught at MI great, great kid. And she's in it. She's in that scene with Stephen Perkins where they're all hand drumming world very cool sorry you pause there for a second my uh yeah. like my wi-fi is freaking out oh people understand that stuff nowadays they, they're just what i love about podcasts it's like this new media thing it's like people are just lurking um around the corner and eavesdropping on two people having a conversation i think it's a great thing <laughs> i love it i think we're good we're over it now so my editor can fix that but 
Yeah. Well, take us back to, cause you had a, a more traditional path than a lot of musicians I actually knew in Nashville. And the fact that you are extremely educated in all things music. I mean, you can read, you have a master's degree. What was that process like? And I think you even had, you know, a ton of exposure and passion to want to teach as well. So what did that look like oh, yeah. before you even got to just, you know, exclusively performing? Well, that's a great question. I, I mean, I was, I always knew that I wanted to be a rock roller. Cause when I get out of bed, you know, it's like, I'm hearing, you know, small faces, I'm hearing the stones, I'm hearing the Beatles, I'm hearing the Led Zeppelin. Um, but, you know, I also love, you know, 20th century music. I love classical music. I, I was in marching band for eight years, uh, percussion ensemble, steel drum ensembles, and just playing, just loving different kinds of music. The pep band, the, you know, the small group jazz ensemble, kicking a big band. I mean, kicking a big band in a tuxedo is just as fun as like twirling your sticks and licking your sticks and playing in front of like, you know, 20,000 rock and roll people. Um but it's just, you know, a different expression. And I wanted to be good at all of it. And some of my role models were guys like, you know, Greg Bissonnette and Ray Brinker and Steve Houghton and all of these guys uh, that kind of went to school to learn all sorts of different kinds of music. And I just wanted to soak it all up. And so that's why maybe when someone comes to see me play with Jason Aldean, they go, this guy's maybe got a diff- something's going on here. He's got something, something under the hood there. There's, there's more tools in the shed. Um, which is great, but yeah, the academic journey is so awesome because you're sitting there with your tuxedo and you're counting measures to come in just at the right time and get that beautiful tone and touch on a timpani and hitting the triangle at just the right time. And that stuff is, is, uh, is like really great training. There's a plan for everyone. Now I have gold records on my walls from kind of like meeting a, a like-minded group of people and starting something from the very bottom and over a 20 year period building something, which is also really, really satisfying. So for anyone out there that wants to go on this crazy journey, give yourself as many tools as possible. Learn your rudiments, learn to read, maybe do a study, a little jazz vibraphone and learn how to get a good sound on a marimba and be in the marching band and wear that ridiculous thing and freeze your butt off on the 50 yard line at the football game, because it's going to manifest itself in your playing in some way. Um, and the reading we do on sessions in Nashville, it's like playing a three and a half minute, three chord song. Sometimes nowadays there's just two chords the entire time um, is, is fairly simple and n- manageable after you've read a 10 page neoclassic chart or a big band chart with your tuxedo on, you know? So, um, so I wouldn't trade it for the world. I, I loved it. Yeah. I think it's laying a foundation that, a lot of your peers probably didn't have, which helped you accelerate your career even more. You added the fuel to the fire with your personality and the fact that you work hard and you show up on time and you practice, but your foundation there is extremely solid. And that's something that can't be traded at all. So um, I think you didn't know what the future held, but the path that you took just gave you that much more of an advantage once you really came into Nashville and the opportunity that you had. So let's talk about, cause you, you have this book I love crash course for well, thank you for success. you're the you read it you're the person yeah. that read it thank god mm-hmm. <laughs> i finished it so i actually listened to your audiobook which i loved so if anybody wants to experience it the best way i think it's your audiobook because not only do you have rich's energy talking through it but he's got basically a really funky drum fill at the beginning of every chapter and yeah. the cool part i noticed about that it's not even you drumming you give so much to the drum community you hired a buddy to do that like that's really freaking cool so I just have to say, if you guys want to oh, actually, thank you. Yeah. I mean, audible is a great way to consume things. Now people are on the go and it's one of those offerings where if you subscribe to audible, um, you get my book free, you know, and it's fun. Cause you know, I really, I am interested in voiceover. I, I did a couple of recent ads for, um, Sabian, which is really fun. Yes. And, um, you know, I, I want to kind of explore that. I mean, like maybe I can even get into the car too. But, I mean, that's a really competitive field yes. and, um, it's a difficult thing, but you know, it's, I'm interested in a lot of things and I, and I, it's so fun to have these different kind of icings on the cake. Yeah, but I think a lot of people are doing that now they're writing the, the dead tree book. They're writing the downloadable book so people can take it on their Kindle or their iPad. And then they're, um, you know, recording an audible version. And, um, I didn't want anybody else to read it. I think it's so important for the author to read it in their own voice. You know? Yeah, that's great. So for anybody that wants to consume that content, Audible is the first path I would go. And then if you guys want 
the what would you say the dead tree version the dead tree version i mean because yeah let's face it our that friend be jeff one. bezos uh, jeff bezos has made it possible for everyone who has a concept or a or a, a, an exciting story to share everyone can be an author now which again like the music industry and all creative pursuits makes the world much more crowded you know obviously and there'll be more mediocre stuff out there so you have to really dig in to look for the good stuff but um if you have a story to share it's now possible for to have a print on demand offering which um is uh is a great thing awesome well, I want to talk about two different parts within Crash Course for Success, because it, to me, it has two storylines. It has the Crash Course for Success doctrine, which we'll dive into in a minute, but it has your story more than anything, which I think is really cool. It has all the different adventures that you had in Dallas and coming to Nashville. And the main thing I noticed, which is what I wanted to ask you about, was wow. how you went about reinventing yourself as appropriate in every different scenario. Like you basically were taking yourself out of somewhere comfortable time and time again to up your game and be scared and out of your comfort zone. So how did you manage, I'm going to call it a reinvention for every new yeah. city you went to and every new challenge you took on? Well, it's a, it's interesting, you know, cause uh, growing up in, you know, Milford, Connecticut till I was 11 and then a big change of life. My dad gets a job. We moved to Texas. So we go to El Paso, Texas, and I start taking lessons and, Join the school band. I'm playing around Texas. I'm in a I'm in a band called Pueblo, and we're playing like Tex-Mex music, cumbia music. I don't speak Spanish, but I'm just like reading the charts and kicking the band, and you know, and then learning to play like country music. George Strait. All my exes live in Texas, and trying to keep those dancers on the floor. Then I'm up at North Tech. Then I'm at Texas Tech, you know, uh, with my God rest his soul, my professor Alan Shin. We just lost Alan Shin. It was a very, very sad day. And me and some of his students got together, but he gave me this nurturing environment to cultivate my skill set, play in six, seven different ensembles every day for four and a half years. Then you go to North Texas. That's kind of my finishing school. I'm there with the Luke Adams is in the Adam Gusts and the Jason Sutters and the Jim Riley's and the Keith Carlock's. And I'm like, Oh my God, these guys are all going to change the world. And they're all, we all have our practice rooms next to each other. And one guy sounds like Tommy Aldridge. One guy sounds like Weckle. One guy sounds like Vinny. And um, they go off and they make their fame and fortune in the world. They get all these amazing gigs, Alanis Morissette, Rascal Flatts, Sting. And I'm like, wow. Um, and I'm in Dallas and I'm playing, um, I'm playing Coolio and Janet Jackson and, five nights a week and playing with sequences with the headphones, you know, and I'm like working on my time and I'm thinking to myself, all right, I'm 26. I could stay here till I'm 56 and keep playing these nightclubs, but I don't think I want to do that. I want to go to New York or LA or Miami, Nashville, started getting some auditions. My first audition was with Trisha Yearwood, Dina Carter and Barbara Mandrell and at great expense, put the flights and the hotels and the new outfits on my credit cards, learn the material, try to exceed expectations, went there with a smile on my face, nailed the auditions. The gigs always went to someone else that lived in Nashville. And then I had that aha moment. All right. No one knows me in New York. No one knows me in Los Angeles, but I'm getting some good reactions to my song appropriate drumming in Nashville. Gave my band two weeks notice which was the safe course, you know, playing six nights a week in Dallas, playing on jingles, playing the mega church, teaching. You could make a good little living for yourself. It's a, it's a grind. But, you know, I said, I want to see myself on TV. I want to hear myself on the radio and I want to travel the world. And the only way to do that is to get uncomfortable again. So at that quarter life crisis, I moved to Nashville, made friends very quickly and then slowly but surely, one gig at a time, one handshake at a time, just trying to rise to the occasion, exceed those expectations, have a great time. You're cultivating your reputation, which precedes you in life, and um, you're making friends. And friends are the gatekeepers to anything you want to do in life. Because people say, don't mix business and pleasure, and it's literally all I have ever done. I mean, I, to this day, I ride a tour bus with my best friends. We finish each other's sentences and we're, we're here in each other's lives to celebrate weddings and births and you know, funerals and graduations and all while traveling down the highway, burning diesel fuel and trying to take the music to the people. And um, I've been on tour buses with colleagues, with 
um, strangers, and it's not nearly as fun as being there with people that you know and love and can enjoy this journey in life together. You know, cool. I know two things to be true about Nashville. One is it's all who you know, which you yeah. just spoke to. The other, which I'm interested to get your perspective on, is that it's a 10 year town. Do you buy yeah. that? And why is that true? Yeah, they used to say it's a five year town. And, me, okay. you know, it, there, the theory is that you're most likely, unless you're independently wealthy, are really saved for it. Like I tell students, I'm like, look, if you're going to move to Nashville, save 10 grand. It'll take the edge off so you don't have to work a day job. And literally, you could just focus on hyper networking, hyper socializing as a job and go sit in every night. And I moved with nothing. I didn't have anything saved. And like I had that kind of like look in my eyes like, oh, my God, the rent is due. I got to get out there. I got to play. My day jobs were... Um, you know, parking cars. And then I discovered, um, you know, restaurant work, which was great because I met people, you know, I served, uh, you know, pasta to uh, Keith Urban and his band way back in the day in 1997. And I was like, God, I want to be sitting on the other side of the table, just hang in there, kid, you know, the pager would go off and I'd have my apron and I have to go in the corner and get on the telephone, pay phone. Hey, this is rich. Did you call me? Yeah, man, I got a gig for you. Five, 45 minutes, sets free beer pays $30. I'm like, I'll be there. You know, you go and you do it with a smile on your face and then it leads to something else and it leads to something else. But, um, most people got to work a day job. I discovered substitute teaching, which was great because I had my master's degree. So I would, was able to make whatever the top dollar was for that day. But it's really hard when you're playing in the clubs till three in the morning, you get home, get two hours sleep, then you got to be in front of a classroom at 7 AM in your khakis with a briefcase. And, um, I did it. And, um, yeah, they just say it. They they say it takes about five years to put enough connections together where you can quit your day job. So for me, it was about that. And then at year eight, I started getting carted for my gigs because before that, it was just like I had a, the most unsexy minivan. I'm a single man driving a minivan, gutted in the back with the shag rug in the back and drums, twenty four hours a day, just schlepping them all over Nashville, doing writers rounds, doing auditions, doing low paying demo sessions playing on lower Broadway, just trying to put it all together. And, and you do. So, so uh, it could be 10 years now in the sense that there's so many people in Nashville pursuing the dream, you know, uh, they're coming here to make their dreams come true. So it's massively saturated on the flip side. It could take less because there's so many people here and there's so many opportunities and you can make those connections and make things happen. The goal is to find your tribe, to find your like-minded individuals that have a similar mindset and goal set and vision for their life and try to create something with them. And thank God I was able to find um, people that championed me. And as a result, I show up for them. So five years, five years. That's fair. I think it is. But it can happen in five minutes. It, you know, yeah. if you meet the right person, it can happen in five minutes. You get out of it what you are willing to put into it. So if you're willing mm -hmm. to hustle as hard as you did, it can be accelerated. Yeah. Okay. All of this is getting me more and more excited about talking about the actual specifics of Crash Course for Success. Like I mentioned, I feel like there's kind of two points to the book. It's your story, but then it's also what you've built out to be a guide to others on how to be successful. And just briefly, I'll, I'll give everybody what the acronym means. It's commitment, relationships, attitude, skill, and hunger. So let's talk through. I want to go through each one and just tell us what it means to you. And, and maybe if you have a good example of how you live that in your life, you give a ton in the book, but the top one that comes yeah. to mind, for example, with let's start with commitment. Sure. And well, you know, these are things uh, people like acronyms, I think for the most part, because they're easy to remember. That's the idea behind it. So um, easy to remember easy to memorize. And this is a concept that literally will work for a fifth grader. It'll work for a 50 year old man. If for someone, it's for someone that wants to walk the moon, it's for somebody that wants to be the best soccer mom. It's really whatever you want to accomplish in life. You can use this concept. You can each use each of the individual concepts, or you can use them collectively. And that's where you will be completely unstoppable, but commitment, you know, committing to your craft, committing to your family, committing to your customers, com having that vision for yourself and making that commitment. Everything starts in the mind. We're celebrating the new year. This is when everyone wants to lose weight, quit smoking, make changes, 
And, um, you know, they say it takes 21 days to do that. So the first thing you could do is like, write it down. What is it that you want to accomplish? Write it down, laminate it, put it on the bathroom mirror, put it in your rear view mirror, put it on your microwave, put it in your back pocket, look at it, read it every day. And the mind is so powerful. So committing to something, it starts with that commitment, that hustle, rolling up your sleeves, um, relationships, relationships in life are crucial. They're everything. People are the gatekeepers to anything you want to do. Uh, in life. And so I tell people like, look, you want to cultivate, if you can, hopefully mutually beneficial, sincere, lifelong relationships with people. And I, as a general rule, mix business with pleasure. And I try not to eat alone. Sometimes I just want to eat alone. Of course, the pandemic changed everything. But if I'm going to break bread, I want to hang out with a like-minded person so we can kibitz and talk and philosophize and like maybe have some goals together and get their insights So I have a lot of friends um, and you can't have too many friends and you want to be on that list. When someone thinks of a drummer, I want to be top five on that list. If somebody thinks of a drum educator, I want to be top. So um, and then attitude, you know, attitude is like so important in life. It's like 99 percent of life. Enthusiasm is contagious. Literally, we can I would love to have an enthusiasm pandemic that would like change the world. (laughs) Mm -hmm. But, you know, it really is. Um, you know, it takes twice as much energy to generate negative thought, to maintain negative thought. So I just try to live in the land of unicorns and rainbows and just keep staying positive. People are attracted to people that have a positive mindset, that are flexible, that are giving, that can take direction. And then skill. You want to identify the skills that you need to be successful in your chosen field. But at the same time, you don't want to Um, you know, you can't make beautiful wine out of rotten grapes. You don't want the moss to grow under your feet. You want to keep moving forward, keep reinventing yourself, keep cultivating new skill sets. So for me, my umbrella of everything I do is entertainment and education. So edutainment. So under there was like, wow, I can tour. I can record on Music Row in Los Angeles from my home studio. I could teach in person. I can teach online. I could write for music magazines. I could write my own books. Then that opened up um, motivational speaking, emceeing, hosting, podcasting, voiceovers. And then I even became, um, in five years, I got my SAG card as an actor. So I have all these creative things that are under an education and entertainment umbrella. So that's what you want to do. You want to see how you can maximize your God-given skills forward. And if two or three of your income streams close up, you still have some other things that are happening that are in line with your natural God-given abilities. And then hunger is having that hunger, that fire in your belly to su- to succeed. And, um, you know, I just say that, you know, passion is your engine. I know that's a word that gets thrown around a lot, but it's for good reason. Um, passionate people are more successful. They make money. They have more friends. They're more, they're more um, satisfied in life. Um, they're healthier. So passion is your engine. And then hard work is your fuel. You fuel that engine with hard work. And if you've chosen the right thing, that it's in line with your talents that you're super passionate about, you will never work a day in your life. I mean, I've played the song Hick time, Hick town five bajillion times, but it is my, it is my goal and my purpose and my job to play that song and to execute it. Like it's the first time I have ever played it. And if there's a little acting that has to go on, like you do it, you know, you have to show up and stay hungry, have that fire that burns in your belly. So you move it all together, committing to something, cultivating relationships, having a super positive attitude, developing your skill sets, uh, not being a, not being a, well, you really kind of have to be a master of all nowadays, Jack, instead of a, a jack of all trades, master of all, and then having that fire that burns in your belly to be successful, fueling your engine of passion with hard work, you put it all together, you get crash, you know, that's what crash is. It perfectly describes you. And I'm sure there's a point too now, nobody else can play Hicktown with Jason Aldean. (laughs) You know what, Drew, it's really funny. I I have, I have a a student named Cameron Shannon and he, um, he's this wonderful kid, a real survivor, um, has Tons of health issues, but just perseveres and is just sucking the marrow out of life. And he was a make a wish kid. And he, his dream was to get to hang out with me, which was such a huge honor. He got an exact replica of my drum set. 
And so he just, this kid just practices. I think he's homeschooled and he just practices all day long. I mean, he can really do something. He's got this natural groove. He knows every stick toss, every stick thing, every lick, every fig. I'm like, he knows this stuff better than me. Two years ago, we had him come up in Tupelo and he played Hicktown in front of 12,000 people and he nailed it. And I was like, wow. Cameron, were you, were you nervous? And he said, nope. I mean, he's just... That's just, it's proof that when you're passionate about something and you can, I mean, it's just paved this direction in his life for him to be a survivor. And this kid is just thriving and I'm, I'm so happy to know him. Oh, that is so cool. I love that story. That's awesome. You're out there yeah, making more little cool. rich Redmonds. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. So then the other piece to crash too, is you take this into a corporate environment and that was something that really stuck out to me when I reached out to, to be able to have this conversation with you on my show was that you've been able to take what you've learned from the music industry and how you employ it to, you said, uh, what was it? Education, edutainment, no, edutainment. That was it. Yeah. Yeah. But you t- have taken that now in the corporate environment. And I'm sure are blowing a lot of people's minds <laughs> to well. think about their careers this passionately. Just tell us a little bit about how that came about and your focus on helping corporate folks understand this crash, crash methodology. Well, thank you. Um, it, it, it's definitely um, exciting, you know, because there are a lot of like death by PowerPoint speakers that come in with their khakis and their their headset mic, and they just totally relying on click, click, click PowerPoint, which I think is completely cheating. Um, I will never use PowerPoint. It's like I am when you come to see one of my events. It's like Jerry Lewis, Tony Robbins, and like Animal from the Muppets. So people can be like, oh, my God, this guy is sweating and grunting. He's living his like you can see my passion. I wear it on my sleeve. And so if people go, wow, if I could take some of that sweat and that energy and that tenacity and that persistence and that drive and apply it to my job, oh, my God, I'm going to be top sale. I'm going to be employee of the month, top salesperson. I'm going to be a CEO. Like they, I, That's what I want to do is I want to give that to people so they can in, in, improve and um, enjoy more personal and professional success. Um, but, yeah, you come running out and you play a drum solo or a hit song, and then you go into talking about commitment, and then I play another hit song, and then I talk about relationships. And so the idea is that is that I want to keep people engaged because the average attention span nowadays with people and just the swiping and the, it's like, you know, the internet is like gambling. It's this dopamine endorphin fueled and what's next, what's next is like, like there, maybe they'll pay attention for seven minutes and you can have climbed Everest. You could have walked on the moon. You could have swam the English channel after seven minutes. People just don't care. So I have to right hook them, right hook them, right hook them, left hook them, keep them engaged, give them some positive takeaways. And whether it's a high school graduation or I'm talking to in a cafetorium to a bunch of K through three um, third graders about what do you want to do with your life? Or I'm talking to big pharma or I'm talking to a tech company or I'm talking to a farming company. The message is the same, but I'm actually able to um, customize the messaging to that company's culture and ideals and quarterly goals. And then the, I get the CEO up there and I'm roasting the CEO in yes. front of everybody, giving them a live drum lesson. So I love it. And, um, the, you know, the people that do hire me seem to enjoy it. And I, and, you know, everybody wants more calls. Everybody wants to be busier, but when I get booked, um, I don't know. It's so nice when people come up afterwards and they're like, oh my God, I learned so much. And I'm just so excited. The challenge is I don't, I only see them for that hour. So whatever motivation or inspiration happens at that moment, those people have to take that thing home. Maybe they take notes and then they have to put it into action. So really it would be maybe smart along the way for me to come up with some sort of follow-up training course or something. But um, I'm really happy with being the, the one hour guy. I like the <laughs> yeah. right hook. Boom. You know, I like it. I think you make a huge impact in that hour. So that's really cool. And like I said, these folks most likely are not exposed to the degree of energy that you bring to every scenario. So I'm sure it's an impactful <laughs> hour for all of them. And edutainment is a great new world. <laughs> so I really like that. Yeah. Well, we've talked about, I think 
what probably are your top five principles, which are what make up crash. But if you had just one that you had to pick, that was the core principle that's helped you be successful in business, what would it be? I think it's almost a, almost a religious philosophy where it's like, do unto others. You know, it's like, I want to treat people <clears throat> the exact way that I want to be treated. And it's just something so easy to hold something on to something like that. It's like, look, and I'm going to show up. I'm going to show up. I'm going to be prepared. I'm going to have a firm handshake. I'm going to have a smile on my face. And it doesn't matter if I'm jet lagged or I'm sick to my stomach. I am going to give you everything I have. And then hopefully people will reciprocate that. But yeah, showing up with professionalism, being over-prepared, being a person of integrity, um, you know, showing up on time, smile on your face, being able to take direction from people, being able to read a room and know when to offer input um, or, and then when to just show up and execute. It's like, and I learned that from being a session drummer. Sometimes you do, sometimes you're there just to, give them exactly what they want and they don't want your input. And other times they want you to bring your, your, your essence and your ideas and all of your experience to their project. And sometimes there's things in the middle and it's just that ability to read the room that only comes from experience. But I would just say, um, you know, do unto others. Yeah, that's great. And I think you love it. I think you're doing Thanks. awesome stuff in Nashville. You're doing awesome stuff for the drum community. I'm a huge fan. For those of you that haven't read Crash Course for Success, find it on Amazon or more importantly, Audible. You'll enjoy some really cool drum grooves along the way. And Rich, always a pleasure. Thanks for being on the show. Oh my God. Thanks so much for having me. It's great to, to reconnect and uh, keep this up. More podcasts, more yes. media, more content. Edutainment. I'm on it. And we'll see you rocking a show with Jason Aldean here soon. Thanks, Rich. 